Hey, hello everybody and welcome again to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master Dave Figueredo. Today I'm going to be looking at uh, what's actually the last game between Magnus Carlsen and Viswanathan Anand before their World Championship match. And this game was played at the Tal Memorial back in June. This game actually it kind of got a lot of attention, you know, because it was between these two players, but it was really a bit of a wipeout and didn't really seem like much was going on for this to happen, but I think the game really shows Carlson's, you know, where his strengths are and uh, why this could be a problem for Anand in the match. So I called the lecture Carlson Makes It Look Simple Again because the last time that they played with Carlson with White, I also did a lecture on a similar game, completely different opening. But really, I think there's definitely a stylistic similarity between the games. So this game, Carlson played d4. The other game, it was actually a, a Sicilian, a bishop b5 check Sicilian. Knight f6, c4, e6, the Nimzo. Knight c3, bishop b4, and Carlson played e3. This, we could call it like the main move, the Rubenstein variation. Queen c2 is the other big line, which Carlson has played a lot too. Yeah, and now black has a few choices. He can play c5 or b6, which you see more at uh, lower level, especially b6 is kind of the most interesting, like sharpest try. But the highest level, castles, is the main move. And then the, the real main lines go like bishop to d3, and then maybe d5, knight f3, c5, castles. And then there's lots of different lines that can come about from here. But it's like a very classical type game, oftentimes resembling like a queen's gambit. But Carlson played knight e2. So this is like kind of, you know, the original idea behind playing e3 to try to keep the bishops. And this move I don't think is usually as effective as it is against c5 and b6. The idea is simply to play a3 and grab the bishop pair without getting doubled pawns. But castles is such a flexible move that black can just kind of revert to like a queen's gambit structure, as he does in this game. And I think that this is really fine for black. You know, having played it myself long ago, I played this a lot. It's kind of an easy system to learn for white. Uh, so d5, so this is definitely the best move, a3, bishop to e7. Now for a long time it was considered that bishop d6 was not so good. Um, the advantage to this move is that after cd, ed, this type of structure, the bishop is more active on d6 than it would be on e7, you know, which is... is pretty clear here. You know, black can play like rook e8, maybe like knight e4. So it's kind of a queen's gambit, but this knight on e2 looks funny. That's the justification for black, like losing this time with his bishop going to b4 and then back to either d6 or e7. So bishop d6, it was always thought that it was dubious though, not because of that, but because c5 gains time. Bishop e7, b4, and now white has this space advantage. But when I used to play this line, even though this was the theory, I was always a little skeptical and always a little worried about bishop d6. Now, the theory is kind of caught up with my beliefs as a 2100 back in the early 90s. Um, black can play c6, for example, and then like b6 and a5 and try to play bishop a6, trading off this bishop. And it's kind of hard to avoid that. White still has space, but, you know, black might get this break in at some point. And he has this bad bishop on c1. Sometimes this structure is is nice for white. Like, it comes about in some lines of the queen's gambit, but where white's bishop is already on f4, and he has a knight on f3, which makes more sense. So I don't really think that this is anything special for white. And lately, players with white have reverted to playing like this move, like knight g3. Just for the idea of developing, maybe to try to play e4, or just like bishop d3 in castles, but I find it kind of hard to believe that this can really lead to anything for white. Black can probably even play like c5 and go for an isolated pawn, because, you know, white's taken two moves to put his knight on g3, so I think it has to be okay for black. In any case, Anand played the main move, bishop e7, and now c takes d5. 
and the main move is ED. And White has tried a lot of different things here. For a long time, the main move was like G3, and then White was usually trying to do like Bishop G2 and castles, and then maybe even F3 and E4. The thing about this is black can do something like, let's say, rook e8, bishop g2, maybe even like a move like a5, castles, knight a6. Black is kind of waiting a bit, and the point is that as soon as white plays f3, like if he does it here, black will play c5. Because if we get this kind of like isolated pawn position, this e3 pawn looks pretty silly. White would like really rather just put this guy back here and attack the... the d5 pawn, but pawns don't move backwards, so uh, so I think that that line is probably not really anything special. White's tried lots of other things like b4, knight f4, knight g3, even h3, where the idea is to play like g4 and bishop g2, kind of a extended version of the g3 plan, maybe the knight can go to g3, so all, the, all these lines are probably playable for both sides. Uh, I think black is, should certainly be fine, but if you play a line like this for black, you also have to be ready for a lot of different plants. So what Carlson intended here, we do not know. Maybe we'll find out in the, the World Championship match. Now what uh, Anand did was he played knight takes d5. And this is less common, but this is a move that I was also worried about when I used to play this line. But this time probably my concerns were unfounded. Um, there was kind of a well-known game that Kramnik won a long time ago against American... Tal Shaked, who got to play in one of these really big tournaments. And, um, you know, I think he did something like G3. And then Black will usually, like, you know, take on C3 at some point. And, you know, if, if White takes with a pawn, you know, he kind of has this, like, Swiss cheese pawn structure. This is weak, the other light squares are weak. And if he takes with a knight, then maybe even just, like, C5. And, um, already looks like it should be okay for black. So uh, this this is a game you could look up, kind of a model game for black, was this Shaked Kramnik, uh, which was Tilburg, I think, 1997. But Carlson played like a good move here, which is like very simple, but quite smart. He just played bishop to d2. Uh, let me also mention, like, if knight takes d5, ed, White is getting that structure, but the trade of knights, I think, should should help black, you know, trading a piece. But bishop d2 is, like, actually a very clever move, because it's, um, it looks very modest. It's really, really in Carlson's style, just a simple move like this, but if knight takes c3, he can take with a bishop. So, for example, knight takes c3, bishop takes, and then he's ready to play, like, knight g3 and bishop d3. You know, if c5, he can always, you know, just take on c5. But the bishop will be quite strong here, because black at some point will have to challenge the center with c5 or e5. Uh, e5 doesn't look like it will really be possible, and if he does c5, then the bishop will open up. So, you know, now white's ready to just play knight g3, bishop d3, castles, and, and have a good position that way. So I think this bishop d2 gives white good chances of an edge. You know, rook c1 can be played too. White just maintains the integrity of his pawn structure. So Anand played knight to d7, not committing, g3, b6, so he's kind of playing like a Queen's Indian type position, and now knight takes d5. Uh, the difference is, is if white is playing it earlier, black's not going to play b6, he's just going to play like knight f6 and c6 and just have like a Queen's Gambit exchange structure. But after b6, then he'll take, because now there's some weaknesses on the queen side, and after bishop g2, bishop b7, the bishop is blocked by its own pawn. And this had, uh, this structure had occurred before in a game, uh, Ponomarev Kramnik, where Ponomarev was white and he won. That game went like knight f6, castles, knight e4, rook c1, bishop b7. Queen c2, getting the c pawn, rook c8, rook fd1, bishop d6, and then bishop to b4. So this is an important idea, trading off this bishop, 
you know, if he doubles the pawns, it's, uh, the pawns aren't so weak. Maybe this rook will even come back here. This might cramp here. It also stops black from playing c5 to a large degree. So Kramnik did something like, um, you know, like queen f6, and the dark bishops got traded, and, you know, once these guys, guys get traded, white's ready to play b4, and, and white had an edge, and Ponomarev managed to beat uh, Kramnik in the game. So this is kind of an important idea. Now, in, in our game, um, Carlson played a, a nice move. He did bishop b4 right away. And the reason he did this is that if he just castles, instead of... Um, after bishop b7, if he just castles, black can stop this plan very simply with a5, which is not a bad move to make at all. It's not like it's some big concession. And then black can just play like knight f6, uh, like rook e8, you know, maybe bishop d6, and he has a very healthy position, and he can play c6 or c5, depending on circumstances. So he did bishop b4 right away, so this kind of guarantees that he'll get to, to trade these guys. And so, all right, so if he takes, then, you know, white has the, the structure he wants where he can just castle and put his, his rooks already on the A file. He can maybe bring his other rook to C1. And if black plays C5, then just DC, BC, bishop C3, and then he'll just castle and play knight F4. And black has what we call, like, hanging pawns, which can be dynamic, but if the side with the hanging pawns does not have the initiative, then they tend to be be weak. So that's also like probably a, a small but pleasant edge for white. So Anna played knight f6, castles, rook e8, all kind of normal so far. And now uh, he could just take on e7, but he played kind of a funny move. He did rook c1. So he's clearly trying to like uh, like lure Anna into taking now that the rook is off the a file. But you know, he could still even put the rook back. Like, let's say he does c6, maybe the rook just comes back, because it's not like black's doing anything uh, special. You know, again, not the end of the world, but a slight edge for white. I mean, the, the big difference is, like, the bishop's scope. You know, white has a much better bishop. And this is good, because not only does the bishop have more, more scope, but in, like, any ending, like, black's pawns could be vulnerable. So Anand didn't go for that. He just played c6 right away. So bishop e7, rook e7, rook e1. This is a funny move. Um, this structure is kind of like a, a Carlsbad structure, like an exchange, queen's gambit, where there's different ideas, and like we, we see them all kind of come about here. And this structure, sometimes white tries to play like a minority attack, like trying to create a weakness in black structure. Another plan is to play f3 and e4. Uh, another plan that can come up is to play like a knight to e5 and f4, but clearly this position, that's not an option. Sometimes white can play e4 and just have an isolated pawn. That doesn't really look like an option. But the other plans uh, are definitely uh, reasonable here. So rook e1 looks like kind of a uh, just a waiting move. It ends up being quite clever. Queen d6 and now knight f4. So definitely the knight might want to come here. It controls a lot of squares from there that could be important. So here Anand made uh, a mistake. He played bishop to c8. So the bishop doesn't have much future on b7 if he's not going to get c5 in. So this move looks like it makes sense. He can go to d7 or maybe f5 or something. But it turns out to, to lead to concrete problems. So this is where Carlson is just so strong. Just some like kind of boring position, maybe where he's like a tiny bit better. Um, even if it's equal, he's just uh, seems to just you know really be the best player in these kinds of positions. It's not so easy for Black to find a move here, though. Here's some examples. Like Rook A E eight is like very natural, but then Queen A four hits the A pawn. And if a5, then he can do b4, a, b, and now good move. Queen takes b4. So this really is going to keep up the pressure on these pawns if he trades. It's still, you know, quite unpleasant for black. You know, he doubled on the e-file, but it's not like he has any kingside attacking chances. So still very nice position for white. If uh, he does rook c8, then uh, queen a4 is again kind of annoying. Like queen a4, a5, maybe queen b3 hitting this pawn. 
also uh, quite annoying. So maybe he should have just played rook c7, which as we'll see is like an idea he had in mind anyway. But it looks like he messed up the move order, and Carlson is just all over him after that. Because he played bishop c8. So queen a4, which just looks like a simple attack on the pawn. Probably, objectively, he should just play bishop back to b7, but, you know, white has just gained time, maybe he plays b4 here, maybe knight d3, still an edge for white, but he did rook c7, and this looks kind of normal enough, but now Carlson quickly pounces in the center, because even though black looks very solid, like, look where all of his pieces are, so he plays f3. He's ready to just go e4, bishop e6, e4, and now this is the thing that can be hard to judge positionally, I think. It's clear like e5 is a threat, right? But if, you know, and if black allows that, like let's say he, you know, moves his queen or something, uh, just e5, you know, the knight moves, and then, you know, maybe maybe this knight moves in f4 at some point. But now white, he has, like, a better pawn structure on both sides of the board because black is kind of soft on the queen side, and now white has, has a majority that has advanced on the king side. But he probably had to do that and just kind of be solid, but it can be very difficult to judge. He took on e4, and then after f e, this is the thing that can be difficult uh, for both sides because white's pawns, now white kind of has hanging pawns in the center, but here they do have the dynamic strength. So this is what is not so uh, easy to judge all the time. But Carlson's pieces, every single one of them is in its like optimal place. So e5 is still a threat. So he played queen d7 which looks like it makes sense, but it's, it's probably just losing. It, it turns out, like, if you use an engine, it says you have to play this hideous move, uh, b5, you know, and then maybe queen b4. I mean, this backward pawn is just uh, terrible. So this, this looks like it's just strategically lost. But if for tactical reasons you have to play b5, then, then something has gone wrong, very wrong already. So he did queen d7, and now Carlson has no problem shifting to dynamics after... Uh, outplaying the world champion strategically in a very clear fashion in only 20 moves. He plays d5, cd, queen takes d7, rook takes, so it looks like everything is okay. The d-pawn is, uh, you know, covered, but all right, if ed, maybe, you know, maybe taking, you probably get into some pins, um, you know, along here and, and maybe along here, but let's just say bishop f5, it's, all right, maybe white is better, but, you know, black is, still has a position, right? The problem is that suddenly there was a move that uh, optically is kind of surprising, so I think this was probably easy to miss. He simply does knight takes e6, which looks like it strengthens black structure, but after fe, bishop h3, this is the point, is everything is just collapsing on the light squares. Ed is just such a threat, everything is ganging up on this, and it's just hard to find any move. You know, he can't do king f7, just takes here, and then bishop takes e6. So he just moves his king, king h8, e5, he could take on e6 right away, it's probably about the same thing. And now he played knight g8. The thing is, if he goes knight e e4, which looks kind of more natural, bishop takes e6, rook back to d8, then this rook to d1 attacks the pawn, which can't really be defended. d4, rook c7, knight g5, bishop g4. And this is probably winning too for white. You know, he has h4. He can probably just round up this pawn, you know, kind of however he wants, and, and strong bishop past the pawn. Maybe this was a better try, but it's, it's, it's winning for white. Instead, he did knight g8, bishop takes e6, rook back to d8, rook c7. It's so very similar to if the knight had been on e4. d4, bishop d7, and now Anna actually resigned this position, which seems surprising, but look, he can't move anything. You know, I mean, he can move his knight around a bit. White's just going to gobble up this pawn however he wants, 
and you know just advance wherever so it's really just kind of a technical exercise even though it's even material I have a feeling like an engine will say it's like plus two or plus three something like that really kind of a shocking victory you know world champion loses in 29 moves but I like this game because it's like very clear it's even though it's a game between like players like around 20 you know 2870 and 2790 or something like that the themes are like clear enough that uh, that we can all understand the ideas so we'll have an interesting world championship match coming up for sure so hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next time on chesslecture.com